welcome friends. It's Cindy Silva. We're with Jetta Molly today. Hi, Jetta. Hello. I'm so glad to be with you. Thank you for saying yes to this invitation. Pleasure. I really wanted to um, host you to share your perspectives with our listeners because they've really expanded uh, my awareness. And I think there's nothing more important than um, challenging our perspectives, per, um, particularly our limiting ones. And um, I've just loved listening to your talks and uh, doing your meditations. And I always feel like I'm coming home to myself, myself, the bigger expansive self, the universal self. And um, you have an organization that you founded called Intelligent Life. Absolutely love that name. Um, and I would love to give you an opportunity to share about how you came to your work and um, how it's expanding now. And I know it's going through some changes, your offers are, and it's just really exciting. And um, I'm really, really grateful to the universe for bringing your uh, wisdom into my life and now to other people who are um, listening. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. It's nice to be here with you. Well, um, I've actually been doing this kind of work for 35 years now. Yeah. And, you know, long before it was as popular as, you know, this kind of work is today. And I've always had, since I was tiny, I've always had a fairly developed sixth sense. I've always had a sort of knowingness that I was born with. And I didn't do much with it when I was young. I was aware of it and had some interesting experiences as a result. But it wasn't until I was just turned 21 and I set off um, to Asia, which everybody went there in those days when they were looking for the source of wisdom. And I spent a long time in uh, my 20s um, meditating and studying with various teachers, various different um, schools of thought and philosophies, uh, and all the time developing my own ability to listen and he really hear and see what came to me naturally as a child so developing that ability to be present and to be aware and even though i had many wonderful experiences many wonderful adventures teachers and i learned a lot for which i'm grateful it never felt like something that i wanted to stay with forever it always felt like something I was passing through, but like you go through the supermarket and you just go through each aisle and take what you need. And I got to a stage in my life where um, I was told by the teachers that I have in spirit that I can now work with the public. That was back in 1994. And as soon as I started to do that, the knowingness crystallized into an understanding of how human beings operate within their own uh, humanness, if you like. Mm. And that deepened over time and is now, you know, formalized in the work that we do at Intelligent Life of looking at um our understanding of natural intelligence as kind of the operating system of all life and the extent to which we understand that and use that as a framework and a frame of reference for how we move and live in the world and how we experience that. So it's not enough just to know about it. One also has to experience it for it to be real, for it to be owned and felt I have a felt sense of it to be like an internalized integrated wisdom and so we did that for a couple of decades actually working with that approach and then over time more in my as I got into my 40s I became acutely aware that 
it wasn't enough just to either know about wisdom or to practice it, that one had to, if we wanted the world to change, and certainly the world around us, that we needed to apply this living wisdom in the world. And that's when I became more and more interested in systems change and in how we could utilize that wisdom in our everyday lives, but also build it into our societal systems so that everybody could benefit from that wisdom. And so the work that Intelligent Life does today looks still looks at the concept, natural intelligence, still looks at the practice of it, the experience of it, but also has this component where we apply it to whether that application is in the life of an individual or a small group or an organization and up to sort of loftier aims about how we run our society. And, you know, in ancient times, the highest wisdom and the way we ran our societies were synonymous. It was the same wisdom. And that the leaders of that society were the wisest. And now we have a very different, we have a split that just because you're a leader in society doesn't mean you're wise. And just because you're wise doesn't mean that you have much influence on society, not at least in an overt way. Obviously, the energetics still contribute. So I wanted to try and bring that together in, in one body of work and to show that there is a very clear correlation in fact, we would say causation, but that upsets the scientists. So we stick with the word correlation, that there's a strong correlation between the way we live our lives internally, inside our own skin, and the way we influence the outer world. So our work now is looking, trying to show, make a case for when we make a difference in ourselves, we make a difference around ourselves and create that positive impact. Mm -hmm. So that's the sort of nucleus of, of what we're doing today. Thank you. Yeah, you just really encapsulated, you know, what I'm um, digesting from the work that I'm engaging with uh, that came through you is that um, the nature of our existence is awareness and mm -hmm. expansion and that just in your own experience the way you've described your work evolving is that the expansion of that through you has taken you through these various stages of the work right that's right yeah yeah and, yeah and it's constantly evolving you know right. there's there's no stopping place it feels like it's uh, a sort of a lovely natural maturation process yeah yeah, and I'm I'm witnessing that that's true for each of us because we all are that expansion, and as we expand, it creates like a wake in our field, and then mm -hmm. other people, like because we're influencing other people. As I'm, I teach and I am I'm a leader as well. So my process of expansion is an offer, right, mm -hmm. to the world of of expansion and um basically what i'm offering is what's getting done through me the expansion that's happening through me is the offer right mm -hmm. so if people want to know what's happening in each of us all they have to do is follow our work because that's what's happening and so i love that you're leading the way and making that conscious you know mm -hmm. by pointing mm -hmm. at it and saying that this is what's happening so that we can recognize that expansion in ourself and turn our attention towards it and see that it's not just happening through us, but it is what we are. The expansion itself is what we are. Yeah. And I think that's the aspect that is not well known, even mm -hmm. though there's a gazillion books out there on various aspects. Um, knowledge is not the same thing as experience. And whilst we might read about it, it is a different faculty for us to take that in and to experience it as a truth within ourselves and to test it out within our own experience. And all of the great he uh, teachers in history have uh, 
uh, advised this, but we don't always take it to heart and follow suit. So we wanted to uh, create an approach where the understanding was there so people could orientate themselves, because I think that's important, and give a, a certain amount of conceptual explanation but also provide a roadmap where people could step into this and experience it for themselves and feel the truth of it for themselves and not just take it as some religions do on blind faith. But this is something that you can test out within your own experience. And, and also to hold people's hands as they're trying to change whatever they want to influence, whether it's their own life or their family, or their community, or their organization, and further on. Um, so that we can start to do this in groups. And obviously, when we do it in groups, uh, it has more, it's more uh, effective, it has more magnitude and amplitude. Yeah, yeah. The larger... There's something I wanted to add to what you were saying. Um, so expansion is certainly one of the innate qualities of the energy of existence, but light and harmony are the other two. And together those three form the structural integrity of the energy which, which we're doing all of our living, experiencing, creating. And so those three qualities hardwired into that energy, encoded into that energy give it this predisposition for those qualities to be expressed. So uh, it's not like we're using a, a neutral building block. We are using a building block that is already predisposed towards these expansive light filled harmonious outcomes. And that gives us a really good head start. And certainly in my work with individuals, I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one in the early days um, that is not the paradigm most people are working from. You know, they're feeling separate, alone, afraid, confused. And those individual experiences are scaling up into the collective. And we see that on a much larger level, the kind of disaffection and alienation that people feel, disconnection from the land, from one another, to our heritage and our origin and it it's tragic that the design is so beautiful and and so intelligent and yet because our understanding of it isn't complete then we either miss it or we in some cases inadvertently misuse it yeah yeah it's very highly functional and ordered and yet if we're if we don't have all the components working together if we don't understand i mean it's like they're all there functioning or we wouldn't be existing but when our perception is skewed to seeing ourselves as separate and individual we're not tapping into the full power of what's available right. and the direction that it wants to go we tend to go um, against the direction of evolution if you will Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, because I like what you're saying is it's it's actually a vehicle, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and like we want to keep our vehicles up to date and uh, maintained, and that all the tires have air and they're balanced so that we can smoothly be carried down the road. Um, when we're not maintaining the vehicle because our awareness has been um, conditioned in a direction that is against nature, against the design of intelligent life. Then we start to have uh, vehicles that break down and um, perceptions that follow that breakdown. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and we see, you know, certainly here on earth, we are not, it's not widespread to be taught at a young age how these things work and the knowledge certainly when I was going through my 20s and I was you know spent a good 10 years studying 
the not the existential knowledge was there, but it was packed into some pretty dense and inaccessible forms, such as, you know, like ancient teachings, which you had to decode or spend a whole lifetime studying. There didn't seem to be anything at that time that I was aware of that was immediate and accessible and usable. And um, certainly as the pace of you know, life quickens, we don't necessarily have 40, 50, 60 years to devote to studying this. We need something that we can understand and attune to. Um, so that's, I mean, maybe it's a little audacious of us, but <laughs> we wanted not something to replace ancient uh, teachings, but at least that could be available and accessible for people to understand in their everyday lives without having to sequester themselves in a monastery or ashram for decades at a time. Yeah. I'll say what, what I really appreciate about your approach is um, like when we, we talked about wisdom, love and grace, um, I hear you speak of those things. And the first thing you do is you just talk about what they're not. And I really appreciate that because that's what, um, like, we're, we're trying to become what we already are from what we're not, you know, <laughs> and you can't get there. And so you have to really make yourself aware of um, the illusion that the construct of the personality is running in an illusion and it's trying to get to the truth from an illusion and it doesn't happen that way. You have to get out right. of the illusion and the truth is there and it's always been there. That's right. this, this is what I'm really um, tapping into that's happening collectively is that the um, illusion is getting exposed. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. In the exposing of it, it's being disempowered. And as that gets disempowered, what's underneath that that's always there, that's the truth of mm -hmm. intelligent mm -hmm. life and expansion mm -hmm. light, harmony is being more um, accessible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think you know we talk about evolution there is an evolution of consciousness so to some extent that evolution is natural and to some extent it needs to be supported because the illusion doesn't fall away easily you know it's pretty robust and you know, I don't know which teaching it came from, but, you know, it says beware of false truths. So as we are trying to look for new answers, we can accidentally grasp for different illusions and think that we're climbing out. This is one of the reasons that we went right back to basics and just as simply as possible, just to try to describe the mechanics of life. This is what life is, this is its nature, and this is how it functions. And once we understand that, it's like uh, we can decode any situation, we can understand ourselves, we can see ourselves in operation, other people, the way the world works. And then it gives us this amazing ability to understand and when we have greater understanding we have greater tolerance compassion uh patience um and all the qualities that we'd like to have so i think the you know the evolution of consciousness is going through um a bit of a testing time right now my, my dog's come to say hello. His tail is banging against the sofa. I'm sorry, he's making a noise. Don't hear it, but <laughs> he, he's only little him. and he doesn't understand about timing. I'm so, glad to have him. That's nice that you have that. Yeah. So um, yeah, the, the truth is actually very, very simple. And the beauty of it is it doesn't change, it's eternal. And once we develop enough understanding of the mechanics, we can start to see in any situation, whether it's a personal experience or something outside of ourselves, 
we can start to see it's almost like we have a lens where we can see which aspects of experience are eternal and truthful and which are temporary and illusionary. And then we have a choice as to where we put our attention, which then drives our subsequent experience. So there's none of this having to wrestle the illusion to the ground or fight it or any of that. It's a very graceful, gentle and natural process of being able. And it also gives us the, the choice and the power. It's not like somebody telling us what to do. And once we understand those, what is basically the laws of existence, um, then we can still utilize our free will and we still can have preferences. We can still follow different paths. There's still diversity. Um, but when we understand that the basic energy of life is in essence expansive, light-filled and harmonious, we have the choice to come into alignment with that. And then that is like um, you talk about this bow wave going through the sort of energetic field that bow wave is automatically dispensing and emanating um, those qualities. When you're in alignment with the energy of your existence, then the bow wave automatically radiates that. And that's when we become very powerful conduits um, within our own lives and, and for those around us. And I think that's... Um, I think it's that knowledge that people want to hear and want to understand right now, because individually and collectively, I think we've all had enough of, you know, the drama, the disconnect, the pain, the anguish, the conflict. We see it all around us in small and large ways. And we're deeply yearning for the peace and the beauty and humanity's got to a stage where many people even question if that exists or if it's even possible. And yet it's right here with us all the time. And that little simple shift in focus, the understanding of the mechanics, means that it becomes a reality almost instantaneously. And for many people, that's, um, they say, you know, it's almost too good to be true. And I always say, well, it's good and it's true. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. You can have both your goodness and truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you are that. Yeah. I wonder if I can um, check out a perspective I have with you, get your feedback on it about consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, so my sense, and it could just be semantics with the terminology, but my sense is that consciousness isn't necessarily evolving, um, but that it is, and it's expanding, of course, and it's everything, but it's like pouring itself into these forms and having experiences through physical form. And my feeling is that it that we are that, and our desire is to... Um, have an experience of exchanging information with ourself through all these different forms and in that exchange you know it's like um a laboratory where you're mixing different things or a kitchen where you're cooking something up and you're making up a new recipe and you don't know what it's gonna turn out like but you're curious and you're um exploring so my my feeling is um and i'm you know, completely open to being wrong is that consciousness isn't evolving. It It is, or maybe there's another word for that, um, but that it is having different experiences of itself, like playing hide and seek with itself in space and time. Mm. So I wonder about how you, how would you would term it? We would use slightly different terminology, um, but the essential truth doesn't change. It's just the words that we use to describe it. So what you're calling consciousness, we would call awareness. So the awareness is the, the just isness of existence, that energy which is intelligent, which is sentient. Um, 
and which is in all places at all times and obviously beyond space and time. So with that also, some people call that, you know, source energy. Some people call that the divine. So we see that as the fabric of all life. And then what we call consciousness is the uh, a faculty which r- arises within awareness, which allows you to notice your experience. So consciousness allows awareness to be uh, self-reflective, self-referencing. Mm. And that's the part that you were saying, you know, that playing hide and seek with oneself. I notice myself, I'm not conscious right now. So I'm playing the, the hide part. And then I need to seek it again. So we see consciousness as that a faculty which arises and is neutral in so much as consciousness doesn't decide whether it likes or dislikes what it's looking at. It's like a mirror that it will reflect whatever you put it in front of. It doesn't choose Um, So consciousness will see everything we point it at. Um, And we, in our sentience, um, decide whether what we're looking at and therefore what we're experiencing as something we find pleasant or unpleasant or whether something we want to continue with or discontinue with. So we would say um, consciousness is expanding in so much as it is taking in more and more of awareness and noticing more and more of the possibilities. Also Mm -hmm. consciousness is um, elevating in frequencies. That means that it is able to hold more and more of that all that isness at any one time. And we as human beings utilizing consciousness in our own ways are contributing to that overall expansion that is happening. So we have an important part to play. Yeah. And without us utilizing consciousness, directing it and ex- doing that exploration work, that experimentation, there wouldn't be the there wouldn't be an opportunity for that awareness to self-reference. Right. Right. That's so helpful. Thank you. It's so technical, doesn't it? <laughs> it's so much easier when you experience it. You don't yeah. need a bunch of words. <laughs> what I'm hearing, and to put it into simple terms, is that like um, consciousness is a vehicle for awareness, and our our system is a vehicle for consciousness. So there's like these planes of reality, or this. Um, kind of stepping down or not down, but um, moving from non-physical into the physical. Yeah, it's a stepping down in frequency because we are in a slower, denser frequency here. And I started to say this earlier and then moved in another direction. Here on earth, we have very unique conditions for both consciousness and awareness. In other um, forms of life, other dimensions, there isn't this veil on the knowing that we know exactly where we are and who we are. Uh, Here on Earth, because we take a physical form and because mostly collectively we've agreed to the illusion that we are these physical beings separate from the source that made us and walking around with independent will and thought that we are not referencing that source continually. We're referencing the physical separateness and the biological orientation. And that has meant that collectively as a planet, we have inadvertently cut ourselves off from that source. And so it means that our thinking processes are working from a very limited framework and not able to take in all the different aspects of reality 
that exist across that spectrum of energy. Um, and we've made things tougher for ourselves in the process. But the upside of that challenge is that we have to work harder um, to find that connection. And so some, some good comes out of it all the same. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, for uh, my awareness, um, tracking this, um, that consciousness or awareness is collecting data on itself. Like if we look in the world at what's like the main thing that's happening is a lot of data collection, right? In our technology, everything we do, the data is getting collected. So for me, I see that as a step down version of consciousness and awareness collecting data on itself for the purpose of evolution. So when it goes to create the next versions of form for itself to have a physical experience to relate to itself and be self-conscious, it's transcending and including, yeah, it's transcending the limitation of the current form and including what's useful. It's not gonna recreate the eyeball. There's you know thousands or billions of years of evolution there that are useful. So I feel like this, um, we recognize that we're a form through which consciousness and awareness is collecting information on itself to be a passenger consciousness and witness the experience awareness is having of itself. I think it doesn't delight in anything more than a self-aware passenger, you know, like, or a, a passenger curious about it self. <laughs> I don't yeah. Know, playful and way. There's a paucity of curiosity uh, on this planet. I mean, I was born with a certain awareness and I was born with a certain uh, sight. So for me as a child, I couldn't quite believe what I was seeing and walking around. And, you know, uh, I've always found it uh, amazing that there isn't more curiosity about where we come from and how we're made and how we function. For me, it was the only thing I was interested in. Um, and But slowly, 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 even with all those conditions in place, slowly, 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 I think we individually and collectively are coming to a place where our values have changed and what is now important to us and therefore at some point will become non-negotiable are uh, things like um, conflict or poverty or um, some of the perennial ailments that our societies have. And it seems when we look out on the world like we're a, a long way from having a sort of universal order of peace and goodwill. But actually, in terms of the strides that consciousness has made and the human condition, we're, we're much closer than we think. A lot of the hard work is actually behind us. Mm -hmm. And there is an understanding coming into play. Um, we're not quite yet at the stage where the understanding of the source and the or even the acceptance of that is universal, but at least in terms of values and what we wish to see, whether we pull it off or not is another yeah. matter. The fact that we wish to see it is already a reflection of how far we've come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think there's there's reasons to be optimistic despite outward appearances. I am completely optimistic and um, yeah, especially when I meet people like you. And um, I wonder if we can just um, talk a little bit about, you mentioned early in the conversation about guides, you have internal um, guidance. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you're comfortable sharing about that or um, how, if that is a piece of, um, you know, allowing ourselves to put our attention on this awareness that's expanding through us, if that's a natural outcome, 
that we connect with an inner guidance that um, is really pointing us at the nature of life, how it's designed to operate and function in a highly um, efficient, loving, beautiful way. Mm. Um, well, one of the reasons that we describe the structure, nature, and function of existence is so that everybody can try it out for themselves and uh, feel the presence of that within their own experience. And it doesn't require us to have a belief in or an acceptance of external guides. And it's not necessary for us to embrace that idea in order to feel the truth of that design within ourselves. Um, and we wanted to create a body of knowledge that was as accessible as possible. And so we don't necessarily teach or speak about um, different forms of guidance because that would exclude people who just can't or don't want to go there. Um, in my own life, I have a very, I've had a very sort of blessed path in so much as it's been really enabled and facilitated. And a lot of that enabling and facilitation I know isn't of my own efforts alone. Um, but we haven't necessarily included access to that as part of what we share because it's it's not a prerequisite mm. Mm. well that's really fair and um, keeps it at a, at a level playing field just to acknowledge that everyone has a unique way mm. of um, having a connection to source and truth mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, everyone can experience their own being, but not everyone can experience another being, so whether they're incarnate or not. So, um, yeah, we use our own being as the laboratory in which we do our exploration. Mm, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's helpful. It looks like it's getting dark in Devon. Uh, well, it's... um. The great British weather has done its best today and it's been oh. drizzly and grey all day. So <laughs> it never got lighter than this, even at noon. But oh, yeah. okay, you're having one of those days. Yeah. Well, the, your light is uh, brilliant that comes through you. It's just acknowledging um, that we're in different parts of the world and different time zones. And that um, I really appreciate this time that you've given us today and the wisdom that you share. And one of the pieces that comes up to point at for me that may be helpful for our listeners is that um, my sense is that a lot of what gets in our way is that we misidentify, right? Like when we, like if we have the emotion of fear that comes up and if we identify with that and we say, I'm afraid, then we get taken on a journey that's different than if we have the emotion of fear that comes up and says, oh, I'm experiencing fear now. And we let it pass through. It's a completely yeah. different. And so in a lifetime, when we begin to identify with the complex of our ego, or our strategies, or our thoughts in our mind, um, if that becomes our identity and we try to navigate our life from there, there's a struggle and a separation from what's underneath that that's always consistent and reliable. Mm -hmm. So my sense is that we're um, untangling from these identities that no longer serve us if, if love is truly what we want or unity and harmony and beauty is truly what we want and we know it's possible, that it's it's not about seeking those things. It's about understanding they're available in this moment if we can take our attention and our identification off of what we're not and drop in and fall open to what is always present, reliable, and expanding. Yeah. And 
if we look at the fruits of individual identity and the various illusions that it buys into and therefore perpetuates, we see that it's not, um, it doesn't lay down a foundation for universal understanding and compatibility because everybody's got their own version of who they are and what they want and how they're going to get it. And when you scale that up, if it was just one or two or three people on the planet, um, they could all choose different areas to live in and not create too much drama. But with now 8 billion of us here, if we're all pursuing our own aims and agendas, and we all have different ideas about what is right and wrong and how to get there and who we are and what we deserve. And it means that we are naturally going to run into uh, the agendas of other people. And that's why there's so much conflict here. The beauty of that foundational truth, which is in all of us, is that it connects us. It's just a ready-made platform of connection. It's already joined. It's already scaled. It's already harmonious. We don't have to do anything other than notice it's already there. And that creates this kind of brotherhood, sisterhood, automatically, this lovely effortless connection amongst us all. And yet it doesn't wipe out diversity. It doesn't wipe out preference. It's it's robust enough that even though we all share the same source and we all share the same essential qualities, we are allowed to express that individually. Yeah. So it's robust enough to do diversity. I mean, we just have to look at nature. Yeah. Nature is all made from the same essential particles and yet it is wondrously diverse and beautiful and magnificent, intelligent, I mean, awe inspiring. And we as human beings have that same potential and we are not currently making life easy for ourselves. Uh, we are sort of fighting, kicking and screaming our way. You said it very well earlier when you said we are trying to reach some kind of oneness uh, but from the understanding of separation and separation will only ever create perception of that yeah. so yeah we have to really understand that fundamental oneness if we wish to see it in the world yeah it reminds me of how um you know on a biological level um there's this tribal program that runs right mm -hmm. like if, if somebody doesn't look like us smell like us sound like us talk like us um then they're some kind of a threat and, and then we have to destroy mm -hmm. them i mean that's you know harsh but on a deep level that program still runs and if it's running us and we haven't expanded our um awareness to see that um it's it served its it served its purpose in certain times in our evolution, but now it as it runs um, through the collective, it's severing our potential to connect with diversity, to to create a web of diversity that serves the underlying. Um, awareness of unity because mm -hmm. that is I feel my sense is that that is why awareness pours itself into form and through consciousness is to experience itself is in the diversity and then to unite in the diversity with mm -hmm. the exchange like we're having where we're both conscious that we're awareness exchanging with itself in two different forms and we might see it a little differently or have different perspectives or live in different countries or mm -hmm. have different preferences, but underlying all of it is the desire for a common understanding mm -hmm. in the differences. And a common humanity. When we can step into 
that perspective you've just described. We feel this, um, we feel this core humanity. And when we feel that, there's tolerance and respect. And then the difference in the outer form becomes so unimportant. It actually becomes a form of delight yes. to see that. And yet we are different forms from different cultures, different parts of the world, different language, different education, maybe even different you know, political ideologies. And yet we can share a common humanity. There's nothing more satisfying than that. And you know, certain aspects of our society have sought to heighten the differences between us and exploit the differences between us, such as the media, which wants us to be whipped up into a perpetual state of indignation or political parties, or even, you know, companies that want to uh, try and create their own group of consumers. And so, you know, we have certain uh, situations where we're being presented with this difference and being asked to buy into it. And it's up to us as conscious individuals to make those own choices about, you no, know, the humanity feels more real and feels deeper and feels like the direction I want to go in. And... Yeah, in some ways it looks like we're going backwards, but it's just a little tailspin before we come forward again. We will evolve out of this, but we're still, uh, in order to bring everybody with us, then, you know, we need to also take care of the lagging edge as well as, as, well as the leading edge. Oh, yes, yes, that inclusivity. Yeah, and again, for me, it's um, the sense that, awareness and consciousness uh, are collecting information on itself right and through evolution there's trial and error yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. that uh, sometimes in order for us to understand what works we have to experience what doesn't work that's right that's right yeah that's and we learn from it all that's the beauty of it yeah. that um consciousness is able to read and understand what works and what doesn't work and and generate wisdom from both yeah. so whether we look like we're doing well as a race here or whether it looked like we're all going to hell in a handbasket then we are learning from that experience and because our attention is pretty short term and getting ever shorter <laughs> Um, but over the great arcs of time, um, we are moving in that we are moving in the right direction. It's just that we we don't live long enough to see the needle move that much in terms of the evolution of consciousness that takes a long, long, long time. It's a very thorough experiment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And our perception or conceptualization um can't take in the whole, but when we open ourselves, especially to other people with different perspectives, we get a glimpse of the bigger reality from this perspective of awareness through different points of view. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. the, the beauty of it too. We don't have to agree with, you know, uh, another person's perspective totally and make it ours, but we do understand that, oh, awareness has that perspective too, that that's a mm -hmm. piece of information that it's in integrating into this experiment. Yeah. And, you know, some of those perspectives are temporary and that's okay too. So we talked earlier about what is um, remembering what is temporary and what is eternal. What is temporary are those creations that arise, but they also pass away. And sometimes they arise for a time. We learn from them. And then we move on as they pass away. But some things are eternal and part of the um, structural design of existence. And it's when we start to, so if we we can uh, res be respectful of difference of opinions, but how do we, if we're trying to create social policy, how do we create social policy, which is inclusive enough to 
uh, be a broad enough church to incorporate all of those different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. The beauty of understanding the sort of the core architecture of existence is there are uh, foundational qualities um, of being that are universal to us all. And if we if we were to formulate our policy based on those, they would touch every human being. It's, it's really the basic principles of our humanity so that everybody would be seen and heard and met and cared for um, and still allow for that temporary layer of diversity of uh, opinion and preference to sit on top of that. But when we really attend to what is universal to us all, then people feel uh, nourished, they feel met, they feel that they matter. And so the, the layer of difference that sits above that doesn't become um, weaponized so that we are you know, fighting on that surface level. We can accept those differences, but we're being met on a much deeper level, which is true for all of us. And it's, it's that distinction, which isn't really understood or sadly practiced just yet. Yeah, it's not fully appreciated. It feels like what you're explaining is like the, the expansion, right? Um, like, in order to be sustainable in form, there has to be um, an attenuation, if you will, right? Like when, um, if we just, if everything just expanded so fast, then it wouldn't be held together like the breath. We inhale and expand, exhale, contract, and there's a rhythm to it, yeah? And it's like, in movement in the body, you can move only so far, and then the limitation of the form will hold hold you in a position that you really don't want to force yourself past and injure, a, you know, ligaments and tendons that are meant to hold you together. So I see that with what you're explaining is that we want to move things forward and expand, uh, you know, give consciousness and awareness freedom to um, expand through but in a way that is sustainable and that it's not a bubble and burst sort of growth pattern, but it, it certain individuals and consciousness perspectives on the planet are meant to um, govern or hold things, provide a little resistance to that expansion so that it isn't um, overwhelming the system. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. And the change that we pass through needs to be integrated. We need to assimilate that. It needs to be, it doesn't become embodied wisdom until that happens. Right. Yeah. So it, it's a, it stays in a kind of intellectual form that sounds good, but unless it's truly practiced and felt and we buy into it with our own experience, our own knowingness, then um it stays in the realm of ideas it doesn't become grounded it doesn't become real it doesn't become part of the collective wisdom and part of the collective conscious evolution also you know we are um on a planet which has a physical component and there are certain laws and forces which apply um to physical matter that don't apply to disincarnate uh, beingness so that we have to also respect those physical laws yeah. as we are creating and understanding how we work in this medium so it's a very unique school that we're in which has that added component of matter which in some ways, you know, throws a spanner in the works <laughs> and in other ways gives us much better skills. Um, so, yeah, ultimately it's all good. Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you so much again for your time. I'd love to give you a chance to share your website, the offers that you have available and um, how people can approach you and reach out to you. 
Um, okay. Um, well, all of our work, the overview of our work and, you know, our various programs, things like that, they're all on our website. So that www.intelligent.life. There's no .com, it's just .life. Uh, we were lucky that when we started Intelligent Life, the new uh, domains came into being and Dot .life was one of them. So that was perfect for us. Um, and there you can find, you know, information about the courses that we offer, the tu monthly tutorials that we run, things like that. And then later in the year, this year, 2023, we'll be launching our online platform, which will be a sort of self-study hub and we'll be relaunching our mapping app, which is an app we designed to help us uh, plot and uh, record our the level of our consciousness across our potential, our usual self and our limited self. So that's a fun exercise to do. So we're just in the process of reworking that and we'll be launching that later in the year. Um, and yeah. We look forward to any interest that people have in what we're doing. And thank you, Cindy. Thank you so much for a lovely conversation and for all your um, warmth and welcome that you've given me. Oh, of course. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thank you to all of you for joining us for this conversation. I look more uh, forward to more like this and to staying in touch with Jetta and the great work that's unfolding through her and her organization. Uh, it's been just a pleasure connecting with your staff and making, organizing this. Everybody's been so delightful. So you attract good people. <laughs> yeah, we're very fortunate. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Bye.